Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Kramer. I'm the president and CEO of BSR, and it's an absolute uh, privilege and pleasure to be here with you at the launch of We Mean Business. Um, you know, four million, as many as four million people from a very diverse range of communities came together yesterday on the streets of New York uh, to show their interest um, and their commitment to finding a way to address climate change. A smaller number, seven uh, business associations focused on sustainability uh, have also come together. And I am very excited about what this represents because uh, the seven of us, and you saw uh, all the organizations listed earlier, uh, work with thousands of the world's best, most influential, most committed uh, companies. And we aim with this new collaboration to amplify uh, the business voice uh, to help Christiana Figueres and also to, uh, to foster the kind of innovation that is going to transition us to a low a low carbon economy. We're very delighted to release our report, which uh, we hope all of you will have a look at. It's out today. And there's one thing I just want to draw your attention to uh, in the report. You know, we know the data behind climate change. The science is what drives us to act. What the report has is data that say something slightly different. Data that show the positive impacts on the businesses that embrace a low carbon economy. Do it through innovation, do it through efficiency, and as we'll talk about here this afternoon, also do it by asking government to create the kinds of smart policy frameworks that give business the incentives and the certainty that they need to go even further. And uh, so uh, watch this space. We are going to continue to work. You'll hear a little bit more about what we're doing here. And to do that, uh, we've got uh, in a day, an, a day that is like an all-star game, we've got some more all-stars uh, coming up uh, to join us. I want to invite up to the stage Christiana Figueres, who is, as you know, the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, um, and uh, someone who's responsible for having people out on the streets of New York for two reasons, both climate action uh, and a new phone that seems to have been released in the last week or so. Uh, we are delighted to have Tim Cook with us as well. Christina, over to you. Thank you. So again, hello to all of you. Um, I would like to start by congratulating so many fantastic people who gave birth to this idea of we mean business because, uh, you know, four years ago when I took over the secretariat, my deep frustration was, well, how come governments are doing this all in their little silo over here? What about, what about those who are actually going to do the heavy lifting? Where are they? And why, are, why do we have these silos? And so here we are, four years uh, later, not only with very, very active engagement in business, but with governments actually beginning to look, at least out of the corner of their eye, over to see where business is. And uh, I spoke to, to several of you about saying, well, you know, it's very helpful that you're engaged, but it would be more helpful if you could actually all come under one roof and give a coordinated voice. Because let's be frank, private sector is not all private sector. There is the private sector, and there is, at least with respect to climate, the other private sector. And the other private sector was actually having a pretty coordinated uh, voice and certainly very well funded. So the fact that you've all come together under We Mean Business is actually a huge, huge plus for the, uh, for the negotiations and more importantly for moving forward with this transformation. So I thank all of you who have uh, who had the vision and who have labored very, very hard, I know, to get this going, but uh, I think uh, you will, you will uh, see that uh, things will be very rewarding for you. Now, um, the context for this conversation that I'm going to have with two CEOs of two of my very favorite companies. Bottom line. This week in New York, the ground has shifted dramatically on climate change. And it's not just because I'm an optimist, OK? I think you yourselves have seen what is going on. And here's the way I have summarized this. Yesterday, we saw 310,000 people just in New York, in addition to everybody else around so many other, uh, so many other cities and countries. And to me, the lesson learned from that is a very, very fervent call that we must address climate change. The time is here. 
We can no longer delay. We must address climate change. Today, the message that is coming from you and from many others today and tomorrow is, well, guess what? We actually can address climate change because we do have the technologies, we have the capital, and above all, we have human ingenuity that has not even been tapped yet. So we can address climate change. And tomorrow, my expectation is that governments will step up to the plate and answer both the must and the can with a will. We will address climate change. And by the end of tomorrow, we should have a pretty solid package that will take us to Lima and to Paris. So with that, I want to put the context of what I'm going to be speaking to Tim and Peter into the can, okay? That is what we're gonna be talking about. How can business make it possible for us to address climate change? Tim Cook needs absolutely no introduction because go look at the lines at any of the Apple stores, so I'm not even gonna waste your time. Tim, please join me. Okay, Good Tim. to see everybody. I have to tell you, not only do I believe in transparency, but I actually practice transparency, okay? So in the spirit of full transparency, confessions first. So I have developed this very bad habit over the past few years of putting my notes on little pieces of paper that look like this. And sometimes and they look even, one. and I drop them all on, on top of that. And very often, my staff will tell you, pieces of paper look even smaller than this. So yesterday, I told one of my colleagues, you know, if I'm interviewing Tim Cook in public, I better put my notes into my iPad. <laughs> to which he responded, yeah, but then you have to make sure that your iPad is actually belongs in this century and not in the annals of history. <laughs> and then I decided, okay, forget it. So I'll just return to my little pieces of paper. <laughs> okay, Tim. Um, Thank you for inviting me. No, we're really so delighted. We are so delighted that you're here. Uh, it, really, uh, it, it really proves uh, that uh, Climate is now at the level of the largest company in the world. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we can say we have arrived, at least with respect to attention, and now the question is, what are we gonna do about this, right? Um, so, why did you come to New York? You know, you're not exactly unoccupied these days. I've got uh, a couple things going on. I, you have a couple but of things. I, I see this as a very key time and uh, a time of very great consequence. And the, from, from our point of view, the time for inaction has passed. And you know, Apple, at its roots, has a very core value of leaving the world better than we found it. And arguably, for us to do that, we must address this issue. And so, so that's why I'm here. Uh, I, I, there are so many important things, but you always make time for the ones that are truly important. And this is truly important for our company, our planet, our employees, our customers, everyone. Well, time, right? Uh, you make time, and if there is a resource that is really, really scarce on the answer uh, to climate change, it's time, uh, Tim, because you know the science is telling us we are totally running out of time. And so what we have in front of us is the greatest revolution uh, that we have ever thought of, that we have ever created. And what it requires is a huge impetus of innovation on the one hand, mm -hmm. but also of demand for that innovation. Mm -hmm. And in my book, there is no company uh, that has the capacity, the proven trajectory, to actually be able to look, not two, but 10 steps into the future and produce not just the products, but also bring consumers quickly mm -hmm. to those solutions. So. If you extricate yourself for a moment from iPhone 6 and from the Apple Watch, what, how would you look at the huge challenge of moving the world into demanding, not just climate action, because frankly, 
We don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. We need to demand low carbon or even better, no carbon products and services. That is the kind of demand that we should be having. How do we accelerate that demand? Yeah, you know, for, for, for us, uh, we've never tried to steer the consumer. What we tried to do is provide them something that's really great, that they didn't know that they wanted, but when they saw it and began to use it, they couldn't live without it. And I think there is a parallel to, to the topic that we're here today on. Uh, for, for us, how do we do it? We, if, if you watch our new product launches, uh, with every product that we announce, we have an environmental checklist that goes with that announcement. And we're very clear about, uh, we've eliminated toxins, that, that it's highly recyclable, um, that it's energy efficient, that because all of these things matter deeply to us and we believe they matter to consumers. Uh, and so I think companies have to communicate to consumers about what they're selling and they have to do it in a way that incorporates the whole of their uh, footprint, not just one piece of it that they happen to be looking good on, but all of it. And I think if you do, my own, I'm, I'm an optimist, I think consumers are really smart. I think they're really smart, and I think the vast, vast, vast majority of the world wants to do the right thing. And, and so I think if uh, the transparency associated with at the product level, so people can really internalize what it means, uh, will drive consumer behavior. If you have enough companies that begin to do that, then I think you know, consumers will vote with their dollars. There's no one out there that wants the planet to, to, to go in the wrong direction or to continue to go in the wrong direction. People at heart are good. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's the way that I look at it. For, for us, what have we done? You know, we, we set a goal to take all of our data centers to 100% re uh, renewable. You know, we weren't going to go through the 30 and 40 and 50, we wanted 100. And, and so we have a great team of people, we have a huge data center in uh, Maid, North Carolina. Uh, there weren't options to buy renewable energy. And so the, our only way of doing that was to build it. And so we're now the largest private owner of a solar farm in the nation, maybe, maybe in the world. Um, it, it, it's enough, we're, we're uh, making enough uh, energy there to power 14,000 homes to kind of put it in perspective. And people told us it couldn't happen, it couldn't be done, but we did it. And it's, it's just, it's great for the environment. And by the way, it's also good for economics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's both. Uh, and, so, and we've then taken that formula and did that again and again with our different data centers. And so now, if you look at our corporate uh, facilities, we're at 94% renewable. And we're, we're chipping away at trying to, to get the last 6%. Uh, now, what we have done is we look at our whole footprint. So we, we look at the energy that our products use after they're purchased. We look at recycling, we look at manufacturing, we look at our facilities, everything, literally everything. And so we're really turning our attention now to the supply chain in a major way. And uh, I think we'll have an let's, equal let's amount of innovation that, there. I, I think uh, a company like you really does have a huge potential to affect mm -hmm. not just your own footprint, which you're dealing with squarely, but also supply chain. So, how are you doing that? Because that, that affects actually the carbon footprint all the way up the stream. It's dirty and it's detailed work. It's rolling your sleeves up. It's not uh, necessarily, uh, it's not esoteric in theory. It's real work and real projects. And, but but at, the, at the core, if you look at what we've done with our data centers, and our corporate facilities, and, and we're building a new headquarters that will, I think, be the greenest building on the planet. It'll be a center for innovation, and it's something clearly our employees want, and we want. And, 
And, and so you basically do the same sort of things with your supply chain. You're getting, you're getting into the level of detail about what are the root causes. And you're not accepting that there's a trade-off between the economy and the environment. You know, too many people uh, believe you can do this or that. What we found is that both are doable, is that if you innovate and you set the bar high, you will find a way to do both. And that you have to do both. Together. And that you must do both, because the, the, the long-term consequences of not addressing climate are huge. I, I don't think anyone can overstate that. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're talking and speaking out be, uh, in a way that you, we would not on our product roadmap. You know, we're very secretive about what products we're working on. Oh, really? I hadn't noticed. But have, you may not have noticed. <laughs> but, but on s something like climate, on human rights, on education, we feel deeply about these. These are at the core of who we are. They're deep in our values. And we know that we will not make enough of a difference if we only solve our little piece of the world. That we need to be one of the pebbles in the pond that creates the ripple. And, and so that's the reason that I'm here. That's the reason that everyone in Apple is working so hard and pushing so much and not accepting that you have to pick this or this. You know, I think if we did that, if we took that kind of approach to our products, we would never make a great product. But the truth is you can't compromise. You can't assume that everything is a trade-off. You can do both. And, and so that's the way we look at it. Well, I think not only do you do both, but you manage to do it in a sexy way. I mean, that's the fantastic thing, right? Because you manage to do it in a way that all of us want to be a part of it. All, everybody is standing in line. Everybody wants to do it. So, so that is my deep question, right? How, how can we do that further? Because when you say, you know, we are a pebble in the pond and we actually have to worry about the ripple. Well, the ripple to a huge extent is consumers. And we have grown up believing that we cannot live without fossil fuels because that's in our DNA. And we have to change that chip. We have to understand that we are going to have to live completely without fossil fuels in the long term. And so how do we take care of that ripple and begin to send that message such that Maybe there is initiative on the part of other enlightened CEOs, but if there isn't, certainly the initiative should come from the demanding public saying, I'm not going to buy that junky product because it's too intensive in carbon. How do we change that demand? I don't think there's a, a, one simple answer, uh, but I, I, I firmly believe that the vast majority of people want to address this issue. They may refer to it differently, they may speak the words differently, but no one wants a terrible environment. No one wants to leave this world worse off for the next generation. I mean, that's a cop-out for our generation if, if that occurs. We, that's an unacceptable alternative. And so I think it's important to communicate to consumers, those companies that do believe, why? What, what is it about what they're shipping? whether it's the absence of toxins or the energy efficiency of things um, or that company's carbon footprint, eventually consumers will vote with their dollars. Yes. And now, is there a magic bullet? I, I think my own belief is there are products you can only create if they're green. And, and so you think about that from an Apple point of view, and because we... Our, our whole model is not on asking you what you want. It's on delivering something to you that you begin to use. That you begin to understand that you want. Yes. And, and so it's not about trying to change who you are. It's about giving you a tool that empowers you to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And our, our whole company is, is, is based on that. 
And so I think to the degree, and I think this will happen as time goes on, is there will be products that are designed and materials, sustainable materials that are used that will create products that only could be created if they were sustainable. And so, so I think there's different phases to this. I think there's communicating and being very clear and consumers are really smart. They'll begin to choose. They'll begin to select companies that have got their act together and not select the ones that don't. And then when you begin to design products that can only be designed in this way, I think you really flip a whole lot of people. And so I'm actually very optimistic about this. Very, very optimistic. So are millennials our hope here? Are we giving up on our own generation? No, I'm not giving up. I mean, uh, you know, you and I are old farts, or, or maybe I am, but I can't I say that too. you are. But, uh, but no, I, I'm not giving up uh, on our generation. I think that the boomer generation, uh, we have to look at ourselves deeply and ask ourselves, are we going to be the first generation that leaves the next one worse off? I mean, do you want to be a part of that club? No, I, but I've I, been very public about that for a long time. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be a part of that. And, and so that drives me to push and, and in several areas. The, you know, uh, when I, I have a nephew that I dearly love that's uh, 10, and when I look at him and I think about leaving the world to, uh, for him that's, that's not as good as when I entered it, that's just, there's no bigger sin than that. And, and so, you know, I'm talking about uh, my, my view, but that's an Apple value. That's our corporate values. We're going to do everything that we can do to leave the world better than we found it. And your generation, our generation, are still a part of that. Uh, our toes aren't pointing up yet. And, and uh, I think, I think all of us do need to take a hard look in the mirror and, and ask ourselves, are we going to be the first ones that screwed this thing up? Because we are the first ones that realize that we could screw it up or that we have up until That's now right. screwed it up. That's right. We do realize it now. And, and when you realize it and you see the urgency, it is time to act now. And so everyone that hasn't been on board, that's okay, but now is the time to get on board. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, people look at some of the things we're doing and maybe they've got some th uh, ideas of things we could do that we're not, and we're, we're very open. Uh, maybe they'll take some things that we've done and copy it. This is an area of our business I'd love people to copy. There's some other areas I don't want them to copy. <laughs> but, but on this, I want it. Uh, things can be so much better. Things should be so much better. And uh, our, the next generation deserves it. So we can address climate change. We can. And Thank we will. And it's we will. great talking with you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks much. for all the work you do. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, first, uh, there was a number of reasons for us coming. I think there was a reason for me coming as a business leader uh, for the obvious reasons that we were invited to come and to learn from others, to support, to create awareness. But you don't go everywhere you're invited, I am sure about that. <laughs> of course not, but it, it is a very, very important topic. And, and uh, when we were asked to come, it was impossible to say no to, to, to the UN, to, to yourself and to others. And uh, then I think uh, I also came for the reason to join the march uh, yesterday, which I did together with some of my IKEA colleagues, on your encouragement. Fantastic. And uh, as, as a civil uh, citizen to uh, uh, do what I can do, uh, not only in office, but uh, as a person too. And then thirdly, I think I came because uh, I'm a father of two uh, lovely children that are 12 and 14. And I simply would like to do what I can to support a better world for the many people. It is, uh, you know, it is something that, uh, that really joins all of us, right? Whether we have children ourselves, uh, or whether we have nieces and nephews, or whether you just even know children, or in fact, even if you don't know a child. I don't think there's a human being that doesn't know a child. But the point is, <laughs> we all, as, a human, as human beings, we all feel this responsibility mm. of caring for this planet that is only being given to us for a few minutes, and then we have to hand it over to the real owners of the planet, who is the next generation. Mm. So it's something that is fantastic that joins across, you know, whether it be government, whether it be business, whether it be civil society, that is one thing that we can actually all, uh, all, all join on. And, and I wonder, Tim also, Tim said, you know, it's very much of a core value um, mm. in Apple. I, I have the sense it's also a core value in Ikea. Well, it is, uh, you know. Uh, some of you might know that IKEA was founded some 70 years ago, and we're very much based on a vision, which is to create a better everyday life for the many people. So we're not really driven by selling X amount of bookcases or Y amounts of these lovely tools that I share from <coughs> IKEA, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, that, that's what drives us to realize the fantastic vision that we have. And uh, if you want to create a better everyday life for the many people, uh, you realize that uh, IKEA is still just a small company. We had about 700 million visitors in our stores last year, 1.5 billion on the web. But, uh, you know, th that means that the majority of the consumers still doesn't have the opportunity to, to visit an IKEA store or, or, uh, or so. So if you want to grow, which becomes the natural natural next step in realizing a vision, we've decided that we really want to grow in a way that we become people and planet positive, as we say. And that's very much linked to the core values of IKEA. You know, we don't only, we don't want to do less good. We really would like to have a positive impact on people and on the planet. So let's talk about this everyday life, right? Because I think, um, in, in a very constructive contrast between Apple and Ikea is that Apple um, places itself in a very privileged market. And I, my sense is that if you compare, you know, the huge market that we have out there, seven billion people, um, and I think Ikea places itself into a broader market um, that really seeks, as you say, to mm. make everyday life. So mm. to me, translated into my climate mind, because I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> focused on climate change. Yes. Um, what that means is, from a climate change perspective, our challenge here is to democratize mm. low carbon or no carbon. Mm. How, you know, if, if you extract yourself now, and I'm gonna put you into the same challenge that I did with Tim, extract yourself from IKEA and go, okay, if the challenge here is for corporate sector together to help to democratize mm. and socialize. Mm. It's not about the top of the pyramid. It's about getting low carbon or even better no carbon to be completely socialized and frankly the norm. Right now, low carbon and no carbon is an exception to the rule. And those companies that are moving forward are really praised everywhere because they're taking the leadership which is wonderful, but is not where we can end up. This has to go all the way down, it has to mm. trickle down, and it Great. has to be the mainstream. Mm. How do we do that? Well, we do it in a, in a number of ways, but it's an interesting word that you use in democratize. Uh, at IKEA, we actually talk about that we would like to develop uh, uh, our range in a spirit of democratic design. 
And uh, that means that we want all our products to score high on that they have a, a great function. A chair has to be comfortable to sit in. We want our products to... What do you, uh, what do you say? Well, uh, you tell me afterwards. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. But you know, it has to have the, the function that the consumer is asking for. <laughs> it has to uh, have a design value. It has to have a sense of beauty. It needs uh, to have the right level of quality so it's built to last. And then, uh, uh, fourthly, it also, of course, needs to be uh, able to manufacture, to distribute, and eventually to be recycled in a way that it's uh, sustainable. And then the, the, the magic uh, of IKEA is that we want to do all this at the price level that makes it affordable for the many people with thin wallets. And uh, when we succeed so, so with that. You, so how do you take that approach and elevate it, you know, because this is, this is the challenge here is goes beyond household, right? The challenge here goes to transformation of the economy, transformation of the production and consumption patterns that we all have. Mm. So how do you take the experience from IKEA of being able to do that, but then conceptually elevate it to a higher level? Mm. Well, I think it's very difficult for me to t tell others what they should do, but our learning... Oh, go ahead. We all do it anyway. <laughs> well, we have a number of learnings. First of all, I'd say that uh, sustainability in the past has really been a lot about compromise. You know, when you build a sustainable product, either it really lacked a bit of uh, beauty and it had uh, these dodgy colors or whatever it might be, and s consumers simply are not attracted by that. And, and secondly, I think also that um, uh, it, it's very much about affordability. If we make sustainability into a luxury good, goods for, for the affluent few, you know, we will not move the world uh, in the direction that we would like to move it. So I think that's the, that's the take that we have uh, on that. Uh, Let me ask you about policy because um, mm. IKEA has been one of the very, very uh, critical companies that has actually very publicly taken a stand on policy, certainly on EU policy and climate change. And you were one of the companies who were uh, most effective in encouraging the EU to take a 30% target. Mm. Now they stand before their decision, uh, hopefully to be taken in October, whether they're actually going to move to 40% cut. Um, so I won't ask you uh, how, how, how you're lobbying them into the 40%. My question is a larger question than that. The role of the relationship between policy and, um, and, and corporate response. Because I have been inviting governments to come forward not only with their short-term cuts that they're announcing now, but also to put forward a long-term target. Mm. To understand where are we going? We are going to zero net. We are going to climate neutrality because it's the only thing that science says that we're going to that we will be able to give us a safe planet. So, from your perspective, because you've already put put some pressure into policy, does it make a big difference for you? Does it make a big difference if in January of 2016 you sit in your wonderful IKEA chair and you read an agreement? that has short term, short term for me is 2025, 2030 maximum. Mm. Short term targets of all countries, wonderful. How does that compare to an agreement that has short term targets and domestically for every country, plus a global long term vision, a global long term goal of where we're gonna be in 2050? Does that make a difference to you? Well, it does, and uh, why compromise? I think we could actually do, uh, do both. Uh, policymakers, for sure, what we need from them is uh, uh, bold commitments on, on how we should actually, in which direction we should develop uh, the society. And uh, we're fine with uh, that they come up with uh, things that are quite, uh, quite tough to, to, to reach. Uh, but what we, what's very important for us is that they count and that they are long term and uh, you know when you base your investments you know you, you have payoff times of 10 15 20 years and if that turn, starts to tweak every now and then of course business society easily becomes a little bit uh, uh, worried and it, it's difficult to uh, to say yes to those investments that are so needed 
So I think on one hand, we really need uh, clear signals on where we're heading 2020, 2025, 2030. But of course, if we could uh, have an agreement and, and uh, uh, publicly that uh, also indicates where we're going in the longer run, that would be most beneficial for businesses. Even if they don't know in the short term how we're going to get to the 2050. Of course, uh, you know, uh, at IKEA, we decided that we should go 100% uh, uh, renewable, meaning that we should produce the same amount of energy as we uh, consume, consume from renewable sources. We didn't really know how to do that. Uh, but, you know, we, we had a bold objective. And, and uh, you, you, businesses, you know, you start to... Ingenuity. Uh, yeah, you start to think, well, how can we do this? And uh, what do we need, where do we need to be by 2015? Where do we need to be by 2017? What can we actually do? And uh, you set clear roadmaps and, and you figure out one step and one step leaves you to, to another. And suddenly you realize that you're going there. And for instance, for IKEA, it meant that we, we decided to invest heavily in solar and in, in uh, wind turbines. And today we have committed to 700,000 PV installations on our rooftops and we uh, are committed to own 224 wind turbines. Who knew that a number of years ago? And where will it take us going forward? I think uh, that's, that's the role of leaders to set visionary targets. And then, you know what? And then turn it over to you. <laughs> you figure this out. You know, one way or the other, I think together yes. we will figure it out. Absolutely. We don't have all the solutions at IKEA. I'm the first to admit that. And that's why we also are at an occasion like this, to reach out to others, to partly to share what we are doing that might be an inspiration to others, but also to tune in what are other business colleagues doing. And is that something that we would make sense at IKEA too. It's about cooperating, it's about doing things together. Well, I think you will find, Peter, that this is room is full of those who are uh, very, very attuned to what you're doing and also displaying their own leadership. Um, my concern is actually that we only have 200 or 300 leaders here because we shouldn't have 200 300, or 300. We should have 20,000, 30,000. Mm. <laughs> that is what I want. So Mark and Paul, where are you? Mark and Paul, they're not here. Peter. Oh, you are. Okay, Mark and Paul, here's my challenge to you. <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> next year, next year, this event cannot be held in this hall. Okay? <laughs> this event needs to be held in a hall that is going to hold at least 1,000, 2,000 people, and we're going to fill it with corporate leaders who have understood exactly what Tim and Peter have said today. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite up my friend and colleague, Peter Backer, who heads uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. But, and by the way, you know, the logos of the We Mean Business Partners, confession time, we don't have a long history of collaborating together in, in this kind of group. We're very excited about this um, as an opportunity to amplify and, uh, you know, be part of Christiana's movement. Um, let me also invite up, if he's not here already, Eric Roston, the uh, Chief Sustainability Reporter for Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, Eric, you're going to put us on the hot seat now, in these Indeed. lovely IKEA hot seats, I might add. <laughs> no pressure, but what should Christiana do tomorrow to get the deal? Kidding. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, this is a topic that probably many of us in the room obviously live and breathe every day. I was thinking about the, the march yesterday <laughs> during the previous panels, and the images from that march will be with us for a long time. Uh, what's interesting is how visible that is in contrast with what we're talking about now, which is sort of the invisibility uh, uh, in some ways. There is no less momentum, no less excitement, and no less innovation what's going on in business today than there was uh, that went into the, the planning of the march. And the We Mean Business report, which, which is out today and available at WeMeanBusinessCoalition.org, really puts a specific point on where the business innovation is, what the businesses are getting from it, 
and to some extent, a sort of how-to for other businesses to go forward. Um, maybe to start, Aaron, do you want to just give us a quick overview? What is the most important takeaway here for businesses that are in the room and know about this, and for the ones who are about to learn? Um, well, first, one thing I would point people to in the report is the research that was done. I made quick reference to it earlier today, but we had the benefit of CDP data looking at investments made by 110 companies. And if I'm remembering the report uh, right, 85% of them uh, were showing um, uh, an internal rate of return of an average of 27%, some of them considerably higher. And so that shows that um, this is actually uh, about business strategy, not uh, just about, so to speak, about uh, climate strategy. So that's one thing. The other is pointing to the visibility and visibility is and again, thanks to, to CDP, with the report on the number of companies using an internal price for carbon. There are a lot of policymakers who believe that we can't have a price on carbon, something we talk about in the report. In fact, companies uh, are already doing it. So if we can get the norms to catch up with this wave of innovation, I think we're starting to see something very real. When you talk about internal rates of return, you talk about internal shadow carbon pricing, you, you really start to wonder, are the CFOs and the accountants in some way really the people who need to be in the room here? Uh, and Peter, you've, you've written and spoken a lot about how the, the accountants are going to change the world. Save the world. Save the world. Uh, what, uh, what are the implications of this report, and how do you get that message out to the companies? Well, I think this report is the first time that we actually come up with hard numbers where the investments, the, the rates of returns are being measured and are being transparently produced. And you see some low carbon investments have fabulous IRRs. Some others are at 0% but have policy incentives behind them. And it's the beginning of the transparency that we need. You know, my problem has always been this, depending on the level of values, you know, I don't need to tell Peter Agnivel anything. I don't need to tell Tim Cook anything. These guys express values, either from the history of their companies or from their personal beliefs. But many business leaders that you come across say, well, this is all great, and of course we want to be good for the planet and for the climate, but what is the business case? And then the business case becomes rather soft, you know, it's your values, it's your reputation, there is the beginning of customer demand. Yeah, yeah, but what's the business case? And I think that's, that's the beauty of this report. The, the thing it points to is that there is enough that business can do today in energy efficiency that has short payback periods and, and pretty solid economic uh, returns. And therefore, why are we not doing it? The other point it points to is that even if everybody were to do that, it would still not get us to the transformation that the world needs. And that's why it's so important that business, I don't know if we want to fill up the Yankee Stadium, hmm. but that more and more businesses come to stages like this, sit here and express why they're part of this movement. And, and even more important, and that's a real breakthrough in my mind, I would call it a historic breakthrough, that tomorrow, more than 100 heads of states will meet for the first time to talk all day about climate change. But at that same meeting in the same room, 100 CEOs of large global companies from all around the globe will be part of the debate. And only if these two forces, these two big engines of change will, will take this on will we get home. Mm -hmm. Are you able to take us to the next step, having identified the, the very high rates of return in some cases from these climate-friendly investments. Uh, a, what are the next? What do we need to know about that statistic? What are the next research questions to to follow up on that so that we can have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't work? And also to the executives who are listening, what's their next step? Uh, who do they empower to investigate opportunities at their companies, and what do they do next? So. Well, if you ask me, I would say there, depending on where your company is in the journey, because different companies, different, different stages. But step one is make sure that you absolutely understand the science. 
You know, we business people are extremely simple people in the sense that we have a rhythm which we call plan, do, check, act. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's the annual budget cycle, quarterly reviews, and you steer your company to get to your budget. You have to do the same with climate. There is a bunch of facts, we call it climate science. You need to understand this, what is the impact of my business on these and make your plans accordingly. Start with the facts. Look at, based on a report like this, what are energy efficiency and other emission reduction targets that we could set ourselves. Set the bar high and start driving your team there. The third thing is, look where your business can be part of the massive transformation that we need. Because like Peter said before us, IKEA doesn't have all the answers. That's not because IKEA doesn't know where to look for the answers, but we all together don't have some of these answers. We need to innovate, we need to invent, we need to scale up in a way that we've never done before. And each business in some way can be part of that journey as well. So those are the three things I would start with. And the other thing that business does very well is it breaks issues, problems, opportunities down into manageable chunks. So I think it was Cristiano who was talking about you know, all the various steps in, in the value chain. So you look at Every, you start with product development, you, you have a look at uh, you know, natural resource acquisition, assembling, distribution, use, et cetera. And you break all of those things down and there are undoubtedly, I don't know of a single company when looking at those things, doesn't find a way to create more efficient processes and, and so on. And then the collaboration piece, I just want to underline that because the, you know, the notion of a hermetically sealed company is, is long gone, that, you know, that, that's a 20th century model, it's dead and gone, and so companies require collaboration to get everything done, so why not leverage that? And what's fascinating to me about this era in business is that it is the best companies who understand best the limitations of what they can do on their own, and that's a little bit counterintuitive, but I think it speaks volumes about how to get at this. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that jumped out in, the, in your research during the report that struck you as, as sort of novel or, uh, I don't know, entertaining, uh, counterintuitive? It's a highly entertaining report, oh, I'm sure. I've read this report a number of times now, and it is in full color. Um, <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, it's in black. No, I'm not kidding. It is in color. But uh, next question, anyway, to get me out of this mess um, is uh, uh, just to take us the interesting stuff, perhaps, that wasn't appropriate for the report, uh, that has that sort of gee whiz, head snapping uh, attractiveness that for, draws people to the space for the first time. For me, it was the scale. I mean, thanks to CDP and the data they've produced, I mean, there were like 1,450 companies part. You know, I, wherever I go, you get the question, mention a company that is a real leader or a CEO, and then you always end up talking about Paul Pullman. As much as I love the man, you know, and then fortunately now we have Peter here and he's getting on stages and to all our surprise and, and enthusiasm, Tim is joining the stage, but that's three guys, you know, as powerful as they may be. But this is a report that shows the data of 1,450 companies who all together have almost invested $200 billion. If you look at the, the ones who on average had 20% uh, IIR, which is like very healthy financial returns. Um, that's more than 110 companies, more than 8 billion of investments. These are not one or two examples anymore. This is the beginning of a real movement. And that's what I find so encouraging. You know, it's great to have a few individuals like we've had this morning sell and tell their story but there is way more mass behind it, and, and that is, I think, where we should go. I think on. that's key. I think that, that this or the We Mean Business report really is analogous to what happened in the streets of New York yesterday in its display of momentum. Yeah. Uh, and Aaron and I were chatting before we came up about, um, about the amount of time it's taken for this momentum mm. to, to be created. Uh, we only have a, another minute or two left, uh, what's what's uh, your takeaway from not only this report, everything we're going to see this week, the 300,000 people on the streets of New York, 
the, hundred, the dozens and dozens of nations that uh, Christiana and, and the Secretary General are convening tomorrow. Um, where will this conversation be next week? How will this week change uh, the stuff we are working for here? Well, I'll, I'll, can I, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, tell me what it is, and I'll yeah. ask it, and that yeah. way you don't have to, you oh, know, like. All right. <laughs> see how unscripted this is. Um, uh, here's what I would like to see. I think that P what Peter just said is absolutely right. And if you were to ask the 300,000, say, people out there yesterday, you know, we what don't would have that kind of time. What, uh, <laughs> what would you expect the level? Of, what, what do you think the level of commitment from the business community is? let's just say that what's in the report would have been entirely foreign. I think it is our challenge to take those commitments further because they offer business value and they, they help us get, uh, get at this climate challenge. And the people who will shape the outcomes in addition to all of us here, in addition to all of the businesses who are acting, they need to be made aware that this is about a, an historic opportunity um, and, and it's within our grasp. And th that's what I'd like to see. And if that happens, then I think the outcomes will be exactly as we'd like. Well, uh, let me build on that. I, I will push the point to a more extreme position. Of the 120 heads of states tomorrow, I'm convinced the vast majority would not believe there is a movement or even the beginning of an interest in business. And what my big hope is for tomorrow, by having 200 CEOs and 100 heads of states in the room, where for the first time they will meet, talk about the same topics, they will, f they will listen to a speech by Peter and, and other CEOs. And then you, you can't but be impressed. You know, this is IKEA, you see them everywhere and they are, they are not shy about where this needs to go. And if we can use that momentum and carry that with a, with a solidly organized process in which business feels respected, its input is being counted, and, uh, and the responsibility is being shared, then I think we have a very successful week. Excellent. I expect we will. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, Aaron and Peter. Thank you.